couldn't help but notice that there seemed to be a fairly considerable difference between the views of Sebastian Heil and Wang Kui. Uh, Sebastian seems to see the state. Speak up a little bit. Can, can all of you hear? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sebastian seems to see the state as retaining a neutrality that Wang Hui attributes to an earlier period of reform and that the planning system is hence relatively above, neutral, um, so on and so forth. Wang Hui obviously sees the party and the state not only as mutually integrated, but as uh, bound up with a variety of social interests that in some ways corrupt it and um, make that sort of neutral planning process impossible. And therefore, he seems to be uh, aiming at some sort of democratization that would uh, bring about a new political mechanism. These are pointing to very, very different models of contemporary reality. So I, I guess I would like to have each <coughs> respond to the other, if my characterization of their arguments is at all correct. Okay, rather than asking you to respond right now, I think I'll see if there are a few more questions. Uh, and uh, yes. Uh, I had a question about, I think Professor Heidemann and uh, Professor Pan both mentioned uh, the idea of working in quick, of state sector gaining more power um, in the market that's been going through privatization, that's been seeing efficiency gains in the market. Um, going forward, obviously, most people think that we need to have more efficiency in the system, um, more private enterprises playing uh, a larger role. But, you know, this is sort of, sort of prediction part that I want to uh, ask the panelists is, Going forward, how much do you see the, the market efficiency play into the role of the state sector? Obviously, state planning, most people don't believe it's as efficient as market allocation of resources. Yes, Rudolf. Uh, I would like also to get, uh, to get the interest of the mutual state. I think this is an extremely interesting concept because, first of all, of course, it's, uh, it, it is grounded in a type of, uh, uh, of an ideology. Uh, and of a huge amount of uh, educational efforts, you know, training cadres and so on and so forth, which somehow, this is not a self round this is not a stage which intrinsically is neutral, but uh, the neutrality in terms of particular social interests is one part of a particularly timely uh, uh, agenda, you know, that, that's rather highly articulated. And it comes with a muscle, which I think also might be mentioned see the fact that the state can maintain a kind of a, not even a broker neutrality, but as a matter of fact, a neutrality of pushing forward in a manner that does not visibly privilege one particular segment in the population continuously, it will do that at any given moment, but not continuously so. The reason for that is that the other elements in society, which in Western society would be articulate, namely employers, uh, associations, unions, media, and so on and so forth, they are, as a matter of fact, neutralized. That is, the state does not go into a situation where it constantly has to ward off very articulate, powerful, and strongly voice the, the, the direct regional private interests, but as a matter of fact, has cut these instruments down to such a degree that it is even able to do that. And I think this question of the actual muscle, we're not just talking about a model, which is all very nice and neutral, you know. There's, there's a lot of political agency and muscle in there, and I think you, perhaps you should talk about this a little bit. Okay, um, Professor McFarquhar, and then we'll... Well, what I'm struck by is both um, Sebastian and uh, Pan Wei's presentation is that there seemed to be no conflict in this society. Not at all. <laughs> Everything was for the best in the best of all possible world. And uh, when we when we know, because the Chinese Communist Party leadership talks about it constantly at the Venice, that the society is deeply corrupt, and when we know that there are tens of thousands of demonstrations against the local authorities at least uh, every year, because we're told that by official statistics, it seems to me that the idea of a conflict-free society, an interest-free society, just doesn't work. And I think you were absolutely right to say there's no mention of people. If you look back at the first 30 years of the People's Republic, the idea that the People's Republic would have turned out the same way without Mao Zedong was absurd. If Liu Xiaoqi and Zhou Enlai had been commanded, Mao had been dead, there'd have been a new democracy and we'd have had the reform right from the beginning. 
and Deng Xiaoping's influence is still lasting. Who was it who picked Hu Jintao to be the successor to Jiang Zemin? It was, it was Deng Xiaoping. Now that system is running out of steam. Why? Because there's no institutional development of the Chinese Communist Party. They do not have a succession system. They do not have a succession institution. Now, they have broken some bargaining between themselves over the last uh, year or two so that we think Xi Jinping will be the next successor, but we don't know. And nor do they know, because they don't have a system which everyone's agreed. Everyone has now agreed to the two terms. Everyone has almost agreed to 70 years old in the right. <laughs> but the succession system has not been agreed, and that seems to be a basic weakness when you have all these interests, all this corruption in the Bonnet party and the society. And the idea that there's no conflict there is just obviously. Okay, I think we have uh, plenty enough provocative questions from the audience for uh, the panelists to respond uh, to at this point. So, who would like to start off here? Um, Sebastian? So that's quite uh, some big questions here, but very challenging. State neutrality, this was one major uh, uh, issue here. I never talked about that. Actually, it's not neutral in the way that um, I think the, the, the recipe for success that I see in the policy process on the central and on the local level in China is realigning state power on the local level, country power, with market forces, domestic or global market forces. So this is the logic of the system. It's not at all neutral. So at the center, and I had lots of, of interviews with very interesting bureaucrats there at the NDRC, which is kind of the, the major planning and coordinating organ, the economic government of China, and they are really having the big picture, no doubt about it. There is some sort of, of, uh, of, of interest group influence, big companies and, and certain sectors that are trying to push, but still this is such a highly aggregating place there that they are really kind of taking the big picture. I'm quite convinced by that, but now the problem starts. What are they doing with a regional level? There we have interest group politics at its worst sometimes, very corrupt sometimes, very pushy also, very ambitious policy makers, also ambitious planners actually, who want to get an infrastructure, a modern infra infrastructure like in Western Europe within five years or so yeah, in, in, in Guangxi. This is something that's, that's really uh, astounding. So what we have there is a, quite a different policy process, and that's why I stress the processes so, far, so, so much here. And it also applies to the people. If we just follow, if we just trace the processes of policy making, how do they make plans, how do they implement them, how do they try to check on them, you find in the end that the center, and this is quite special, um, kind of limits its policy initiative to setting major objectives, long-term objectives. How the lo local governments find the policy instruments, it's given to them, and they do it usually, and this is very powerful in my opinion, and did quite a lot of research on that, through policy experimentation. So they really try things out, and then things go terribly wrong sometimes, clearly. There's failure, there's waste, there's corruption, there's uh, sometimes loss of, of, uh, of, of sight of the ob objectives. So that's something that's very clear. If you just trace the processes, Deng Xiaoping will show up in legitimating experimentation, for example. He will also show up in, and, and Israel knows that much better than I do, he will also show in criticizing the planners and pulling them back and saying planning in that way doesn't work, we, maybe the growth rate, but not more than that or something like that. Very hands-on. So actually what I would suggest, and this is my suggestion to, to, to a kind of a re, relaunching a new approach to, 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 to studying Chinese political economy, is trace these processes, be open to all the factors that move in, that come in, in the play, and then the politics are clearly inside of it. So we have fields, now let's, let's face the big programs, we have um, an infrastructure planning. This is a huge process when the funding alone is, is gigantic that's taken place. And Victor Xu is over there, he knows how the funding takes place. This is on the local level, uh, completely, he's, he's given a very detailed study on that. Um, this is completely messy and extremely corrupt, but still, and this is the surprising thing, they, they get things quite good, well done in some, in some uh, 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 provinces there. So we have this tension here. I want to stress that the tension is caused by the center more and more kind of retreating to the policy setting, the prioritization, priority setting function, and leaving the implementation, leaving identifying the instruments to the localities. And there, things become messy. But still, I would hold that uh, this kind of neutral central state um, administration, technocratic administration, can be found in some parts of the Chinese administration. That's what I would really support. Okay, um, Barry, do you want to weigh in on this question? I, I'd love to. I mean, um, 
You know, it seems to me that one of the, the difficult things is, is putting into our consideration the fact that for most of the last 30 years, marketization as a direction, <coughs> as a process, has been the, the presumption in which a lot of these other in, uh, consultative institutions are, are taking place. And so there's always this ambiguity in our understanding because we're looking at a system that's improving its performance by opening up uh, functioning until very, very recently. And, in, and uh, you know, so the question of, the, I mean, it was raised separately, but I think it's very much an important part of this, is of, of Guo Jin Min Tui. What does it matter that the state has expanded a little bit in the last year or two? Well, substantively, it's not important at all. We're, these are relatively minor cases. But in a bigger sense, it's really important because it means that people no longer have the assurance that the area of choice and direct personal control is expanding. And I, and I, I think that really changes people's behavior enormously. And it also throws into light the, the, other, the other side of institutionalization. I mean, Rod said there's no succession system and there's no open expression of conflict of interest. So there's no formal institutionalization of certain things. But what that means is we see instead a kind of extreme formalization of certain kinds of practices. For instance, this idea that we're actually going to know who the leader is in 2022 and that, you know, the third plenum of every party is on economics. Every five years we're going to talk about economics. I mean, it's it's a completely, in some on some level, crazy form of over-institutionalization to try and compensate for the fact that we don't have other types of institutionalization. Panway, would you like to? Okay. Uh, the, the, the first is about market efficiency vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state enterprises. I don't think that uh, state enterprises means uh, uh, inefficiency. And uh, state enterprises everywhere, there are, uh, they are everywhere, and they can do pretty well. And uh, I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the state allocation of the resources might uh, be inefficient, but state enterprises independently operating can be quite efficient. And uh, then uh, in China's case, I don't think it's a guo jin min jin. In most cases, it's, I mean, guo jin min tui, but guo jin min jin. And uh, I think that is, uh, uh, so far, uh, there are not really uh, a, a major problem between uh, state enterprises and private enterprises. But in the recent uh, months, we're talking about in the real estate, uh, in, the, in, in getting the land. So uh, the state enterprises have a lot of more money. So the this government decides that to, I mean, just in a few months, the government decides to, to take the state enterprises out of this land market. So uh, for me, it's not a major problem. It's mainly a media problem, uh, the guo jin min, the min, min tui. And uh, um, as to the state neutrality, I think uh, uh, Wang Hui is right. It has to do with the social structure and the state neutrality. Uh, whether it is neutral or not, uh, I think the social structure really allows, or not really allows, but uh, propels a, a, a kind of a uh, a kind of a so-called neutral uh, government. But actually, the Communist Party is the problem. Is not about its neutrality but about its uh, advancedness, uh, whether it's a vanguard or not. It has a, has a progressive idea or not. Uh, politically, it's not really uh, neutral. It is about leading uh, in, 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 in that way. And uh, so that uh, uh, here I come back to to Professor McFarquhar's uh, uh, question that the, the, the model uh, lacks conflict uh, well, for me, uh, it is mainly about the descriptive model, about the Chinese system, which is different from the uh, most of the Western systems. And uh, I want to say it is a revival of an old traditional system. 
it is also a modernized, revised version of the traditional Chinese system. It's descriptive. But then if we want to say about its internal conflicts, of course, it's full of conflict, just like in any Western system. For example, the neutral bureaucracy, the neutrality, which really means that they are not representing interest groups, but they represent themselves. And so that it's corruption is a problem. <laughs> it's not about pork barrel is a problem. It's another problem. And uh, in, in terms of economy, the state sector and private sector, in, by times, they may have conflicts. Even in Africa, they have. Uh, okay. And in social systems, uh, yes, of course, we, we see the, uh, the, the, this kind of, uh, uh, well, the, the whole chart, actually, in everywhere, there are conflicts. But the thing is that if we describe the conflicts, we don't, we can't make it for the 10 minutes <laughs> required. So the first thing is that I have to, <laughs> we have to, to describe the system first and then uh, spot the problems. But I understand that the, 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 while raising the question of conflicts actually points to the sustainability problem whether this system is sustainable. But for me, it's a kind of a system that sustained for 2,000 years. And uh, for sustaining even each dynasty, major dynasty, around 300 years. So its revival, it's, uh, in, in one way or another, shows the, the traditional or something called Chinese uh, is sustainable. Founding dynasties only lasted a couple of generations. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Founding dynasties only lasted a couple of generations. Uh, well, it can be 17 years, right? <laughs> in Qin, Qin dynasty. <laughs> it could be short, but the whole system, actually, Qin system survived until even today, I, I could say that. <laughs> Professor Kokubun, <laughs> would you like to uh, comment on this? Uh, probably just a brief uh, two comments. First of all, uh, no. Uh, you have to never forget about the lessons of uh, the uh, Soviet collapse, anyway. Uh, why that happened, the, the separation of a party and uh, the uh, government. And uh, why the Tiananmen occurred, probably, the separation of a government and a state and uh, the uh, party. So I think uh, China is exactly that. I think uh, still the party states going on. And the party is expanding still. So the problem is how they separate the party and uh, government. That is the key issue, of course, in the future. But uh, it's really, it's really difficult uh, so far. And the state-owned enterprises are everywhere. And uh, now, it, of course, uh, half of uh, state-owned enterprises are, are, are disappear. But now they are dominating the economy. And also, vested, as I mentioned, that the vested interest and uh, they never they got corruption everywhere. So I'm still uh, down about the uh, uh, kind of a state neutrality. So it's a, a long way to go still. Uh, uh, the secondary, I, I, I'd like to talk about what you mean by st stability. Well, when you talk about China's, well, China's stable. Of course, by, by force, uh, by a certain, uh, you know, power by, from above. Um, so, for example, I say, if you look at the Japanese politics, is uh, stable or not? If you look at the, the uh, Japan's, uh, the relationship between the, s the state and society, it seems to be very stable, too stable. In the past three or four years, uh, four prime ministers, uh, you don't, probably you don't remember who are there, <laughs> yeah, right? Abe, Fukuda, Aso, and then Hatoyama, probably next could be <laughs> coming again, right? So, but if you look at uh, the, the uh, state society relationship, it's very, very stable, too stable in some ways. But in case of China, of course, it's stable, but by force. That is not stable. So, that China, I think, uh, uh, now has been changing because uh, societies really has been changing and uh, uh, lots of uh, frustrations and also demands everywhere. And also I looked at the, these days uh, the, uh, the role of medias. I think in the past uh, 
probably half a year or so, they are really changing. And they used to look at disaster, uh, kind of a mouth of uh, the governments or parties. But now they started looking at uh, the uh, society more than before. Why? The tremendous pressure from, from the below. So they are switching, probably. Some, so if you look at the internet and so on, I think it's very interesting. So Google case, Google issues, I think this is, people say that this is a sign of uh, very, very powerful, the political system, something like that. It's not true at all. This is a sign of weakness of Chinese political situation. So, uh, so if that is going to be allowed, like this. So this is the present situation. This is my impression. Yeah, thank you. Let, and let me uh, let Professor Wang Hui make some comments, and then we'll break for a, a coffee break and return. Professor Wang. OK. Um, I tried to answer the Professor Phil Smith's question that uh, obviously both of us actually don't want to use neutrality in the rhetoric. We, we didn't say that. And, uh, and I also argue, especially I argue that uh, that neutrality is not, in a sense, you said that there is a, a central plan a system, but it's a result of the political process. It's a long pro political process. Without that, it's difficult to understand that, that the, 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 the government in, that, in the, in the post-Cultural Revolution era, in that period, the people convinced that, that they represent the general interests of the, the whole people, even when Deng Xiaoping argued for the uh, allow people reach uh, the first, no resistance from below because they b believed that the, the government was neutral in, in a sense. But that neutrality was achieved through the non-neutral process, political process. I, this is the one issue. That's why I, I, the, the, my question is that now the uh, integration of the party into the framework work of the state was the, uh, I say this, in China was the one phenomenon, but it's a general phenomenon somehow because the uh, transformation of the party system in the whole worldwide even. You could say, the, in the 80s, we talk about the separation between the government and the party, which was the top issue for the political reform. But in the after the 90s, nobody, most of people don't care so much about that. Why? That the, this is the question. Because the, uh, following the process of marketization, the state was integrated into the market activities. So the only thing that the political organization played the role of the more representative of the neutrality. So that's why the slogans for the party transformed so much into the, like a harmonious society, three representative scientific uh, development, and so on and so forth, which was much neutral. All these terms were neutral rather than political with the uh, special uh, value and orientation. That's the, uh, my, is, uh, the Pan Wei said that it's not because it's, uh, the, in these regards, I share the views with Pan Wei that uh, it's, it's nothing to do with the neutrality of the party. It's really related to whether or not the political party can raise their clear political value and the orientation. Without that, it, you look at the uh, neutral, so-called neutral government, was that the, the, the historical result? It's not the neutrality of political value. So in this, in this case, I think it's a, a real issue to talk, think about the, what kind of the new orientation for, for the political reform. This is the one aspect. Second is that I think that when we talk about the uh, like a state from above and the central and so on and so forth, we used to reduce the complicity of the process of the policy making process. The, uh, because even the, uh, the people used to use the term authoritarian state it, 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 about, about Chinese, the, the current, the political system. But look back, look at the uh, last decades, the interaction between the pu public opinion and intellectual debates and the policy making process, the policy change. You found that a certain kind of the uh, mechanism that, that was there, the rural crisis issue was raised by the intellectuals spread over to to the mass media, forced the government to change that policy. Health care issue was also in 2003 because of the SARS crisis and the whole public opinion forced the government to change the whole plan. So in that way, what kind of mechanism, that kind of the, we can use that term, the elements of the democracy there, but it's not necessarily formalized that. 
at the same time, we know that, that there was a certain kind of the debate within the, 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 the system. So how can evaluate that, develop that element into the new, the, the, the future of the, uh, the, the political the, the, the system? I think that's the, uh, the starting point, that to, to find out what kind of the element there to develop that into the future. I think that's the, uh, the, 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 the element, because the, the, for example, the political debates and the strategic debate within the government was very important issue, and also the state itself was not the totality now. You can find every social conflict that happened, different factors try to involve in. So they're confining each other in some sense. And also Professor Perry's, uh, the, the, the chap your chapters about the protesters, your, your last argument is that they used the socialist, for example, the legitimate terms, the slogans, to against the state policy. But eventually that turned out to be the system, system supportive. But which means the system supportive means that the, there was certain kind of the internal driving force for the self-change, which not simply from the uh, above, but also from the uh, bottom too. So this is a kind of the interaction within the whole social, the, the, the social space. So in that way, I think it's uh, when we think about the, the uh, political future of China, the, I think that was the, the, the uh, Professor Hellman's uh, the, the basic orientation. I agree with that. The first of all, we need to find what what there. Then we can develop that into the new systematic institutional framework. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, so we will now take about a 10-minute coffee break for those of you who would like to return for more. Um, and there should be coffee available one floor above us uh, here. And there also are restrooms on this floor and perhaps on the floor above as well. I'm not sure, but there are restrooms right out the door here. And we will reconvene then um, a little after, a quarter after four. A number of questions came up uh, during the coffee break. So I think several of you have questions that you're already prepared to raise of the panelists. And uh, let me just open the floor uh, to those of you who'd like to raise questions at this point. Peter? Uh, as I recall, Wang Wei's uh, rap, Cross. Pan Wei. Pan Wei. <laughs> Pan Wei's uh, Cross. Family values. Uh, dominant feature. <laughs> Family values seem to be more characteristic of rural agrarian societies. Uh, urbanized societies, mediaized societies, mobilized societies <coughs> tend to be much more individual in many cases. Uh, is China facing a transition in this regard with respect to individual versus family related values? Or is China's family system more Chinese than it is agrarian and rural in its origin basis? Okay. Yes, Gan Chiao. I guess I have a question uh, for Professor Pan Wei, but also for other panelists, if you have any comments. So uh, what I've learned from all these you know, conversations and talks is actually uh, you try to uh, interpret what, what has happened in the past, you know, three decades or maybe long, long time space, you know, six decades or even over, over 100 years. But then to me, I would say the question uh, here is, okay, if you try to come up with some kind of a new understanding, either a conventional way Either so-called marketing and democracy uh, paradigm, or new type of way, more kind of local knowledge uh, way of approach uh, to understand China. But then the question is like uh, this one: uh, To what extent do you think the current system, whatever you know, you describe, whatever you portray, the current system somehow can uh, confront or can uh, address the challenges which somehow permeates uh, within that system. Uh, in China, and to what extent they might not be able to address, and what kind of possible, you know, more systematic or institutional changes probably have to take place in order to sustain the systems. Okay. Yes, Victor. Uh, I have a question for Pan Wei and Wang Hui. Um, how would you interpret, using your each of your own models, interpret the seeming proliferation of buying and selling offices, right? So, Mai Guan, Mai Guan, 
Um, it's, it's becoming, I mean, just from the cases that we've seen, you know, pretty serious phenomenon. Like in Chongqing, you have the entire police force, you know, operating on the sort of very commercial basis. Uh, in Shenzhen, you have a mayor of Shenzhen who basically bought every step of his promotion up to the mayoral post of Shenzhen, which is a vice uh, provincial level. I mean, do you see it as an anomaly or is this part of a larger trend in, in each of your respective models? Another question before we turn back to the panelists. Yes. It seems to me the panelists today is uh, trying to figure out a, a kind of a new model to counteract the, the, the Western so-called uh, uh, market democratization model. But uh, in my mind, the, almost all the models are misleading intellectually. Uh, like the, 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 the market democrat, demo, the democratization model is, is like a hidden Eastern egg. Uh, uh, Western social science, scientists, it's uh, actually there are many kind of approaches to understand understand the, the Western society. Now in China also, but so it's uh, the, it seems we try to rationalize those past 30 years. Uh, all the facts, all the, the, the history the full of heart, heart, part of the history, but the, the grand design of the history. But in China, there were all of the so many soft, we call it soft part of history. I mean, so many sufferings, twistings, and twisting and turns, uh, uh, and the conflicts. So maybe we have to combine the two. Even in the West, there, there were, in the West, the so-called models, there were many uh, uh, twisting and turns and uh, conflicts in, in the past, in the industrialization process, in China also. So that's, uh, is it uh, uh, reasonable to find, to try to find a, a kind of so-called China model to, 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 to help us out from the, the pitfalls of the Western uh, so-called Western social science model. Uh, uh, is that helpful for us to understand the past 30 years of China or even in the future, uh, the next uh, 10 years or 30 years? Uh, you're perhaps not a social scientist? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a political scientist. Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but having serious doubts, perhaps, about the whole enterprise. Um, let's turn back uh, to the panelists and uh, allow them to answer, uh, whoever among them would like to answer. Why don't you put up your hand uh, if you would like to answer, otherwise I will call on you. Pan Wei, clearly you've given the most provocative paper since you have okay. the most questions. Um, uh, I'm so glad to see Peter here. And a quarter of a century ago, uh, 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 the institution he worked for uh, paid for my uh, study in the U.S. <laughs> and uh, we met there in Beijing, he interviewed me. And uh, so uh, here about the family, uh, whether the family value or family uh, tradition is the um, traditional one which will diminish uh, with modernization and with an urbanization. I think in, it, it seems that it's a, uh, it is the uh, tendency in many other countries, particularly in the West. But in China, well, there is no religion um, or tradition of a strong uh, a single god uh, uh, religion. And uh, so the va social v value is prevailingly the, uh, uh, the family uh, value. And uh, during the urbanization, I do not see it's diminishing. The family size is diminishing, but this single child family, I mean this single child that I'm teaching, I see how actually they are more, uh, uh, they're closer to the parents and uh, from particularly those kids uh, si from the single, uh, a single child family, they really talk about their parents. They want to pay for, for their, their care and their grandparents. It surprised me. And also I see this uh, continuity of rural family enterprise to today's family 
uh, enterprise. I mean, uh, excuse me, the family farming to today's uh, urban uh, family enterprise. So it's a natural transformation, and it seems that logic continues. That's why I see this Chinese system as a revised, uh, uh, a revival of the old Chinese system. And uh, of course, you can see this is, uh, uh, you might say this is a, 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 a self-fulfilling uh, uh, thing. I mean, there was a hidden egg there, and uh, we buried it <laughs> by ourselves. <laughs> and uh, uh, so this is uh, still the strong value, I think, in, in China. And Qingming is now, I mean, uh, yesterday it was Qingming, really, uh, it's, a, it's almost involves everybody and the revival of this old ancestor worship. And uh, uh, as to the local knowledge, I mean the Chinese uh, knowledge, whether it can address this current issue. And uh, it reminds me of one thing that in the, in the late 80s, we thought there are lots of problems that cannot be solved. And unless there will be a revolution or overthrowing this uh, whole system or the westernizing the Chinese system. But then those things, this, those old issues, we now don't remember even. And uh, economic, social, political, they're all overcome. And today people say, hey, these, uh, the, the, the housing prices, the corruption, and so on. Uh, everybody, I mean, almost uh, uh, many, many people don't believe that this current system can handle this, those, those problems. But I tell them that in the past, and just 20 years ago, our problem is, uh, was uh, uh, unable to pay for a color TV. And 10 years ago, our problem was the family unable to pay for a car. And uh, today, it's, uh, our family unable to pay for the housing. It's a similar problem like in the US. So this is the progress. And lots of problems can be solved. And if you think that Singapore is a way to solve housing problem, and why not China? And uh, so that I don't think that this system, uh, well, I'm taking the risk to predict that this system is sustainable. And once it sustains for more, another 20 years, it becomes self-strengthening. Well, the Chinese would be much more confident to its own system than before. And uh, as to corruption, the same thing, uh, the purchase and selling offices. Uh, yes, it's a new problem. And uh, this new problem, whether I'm confident to curb corruption, I mean, this issue of uh, curbing corruption, I think I will, I would bet that they can be curbed. And uh, with slower, slowing down of the economy. Okay, and uh, whether this, uh, this market economy, whether this, uh, I mean, uh, market democracy, this kind of a term could describe, uh, I mean, uh, applicable to today's China, why, why these people uh, challenge this uh, frame, uh, conceptual framework? I think because it has a problem. Because it's keep predicting the collapse of China, keep predicting democratization of China, while well, China hasn't done that and progressed and become prosperous and becomes one of the major uh, powers in the world, or even talking about Chimerica. So whether uh, China would become another Soviet Union, I mean, uh, after a few decades and collapsed to nothing, be reduced to nothing, uh, I think be careful when we predict that because China is by size and by its cultural tradition is much more profound than the Soviet Union. So uh, I wouldn't risk predicting that China will collapse in 10, 15, 20 years. Okay. Would others of the panelists like to comment on this question about uh, what is the point of seeking a model to explain what's happened in China? Sebastian? Say something. Um, we are not actually, I, I never use the word model. 
if I talk about China, and this has a clear uh, um, um, origin. I mean, it's, it's, there is no model with replicable institutional factors, variables, or standard recipes that we could just trans, um, that we could transfer to other contexts. There is nothing like that. But there's something there that I find interesting, and that's really some, that, that's about how policy, how problem solving is being approached, how policy processes are being organized in China. Just two examples for the 21st century, two questions actually. Can we be sure that the short-termism in policy making that we have become used to in the 20th century is sustainable in the 21st century? If we take climate policy, climate problems, environmental policy, problems, even demographical problems seriously, it's clearly a long-term policy-making issue for strategic policy coordination over the long term. Is the Western kind of policy-making mode really made to deal with this challenge? I'm not sure. Maybe, and this is just a question, something that comes to my mind because there are new challenges in this 21st century. The governance mode that might be successful in this century might be very different from what we have seen in the last two centuries. So another thing is, do we know how we approach, how we deal with, we have this talk already during the, the lunch table, um, how we deal with the, the consequences, the impact of democratic change, of aging societies all over the globe. This is a huge, huge impact thing on societies, on politics, on economics, everything, morality even. It's a big thing. We do not know the policy packages, how to deal with this. So policy experimentation might be really necessary in that. And here we have two, just two arguments where the Chinese might have some good approaches to, 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 to demonstrate to us. The first is strategic policy coordination in these long-term issues. I think we are quite weak in the West about that. And um, the other thing is policy experimentation, finding out, finding policy instruments that we do not know yet today and to recombine old ones, new ones, and try out new policy packages. Also, China in this respect, thanks to the policy process, a very creative and kind of volatile also policy process, they have probably, I will just, uh, this is a hypothesis, they might have more potential to tackle these two policy challenges. Would other panelists like to comment, Kokobun? Yes. Well, actually, I mentioned about the, uh, uh, the uh, how we evaluated the Chinese uh, model. Uh, I said, uh, uh, to conclude, nothing new so far. Nothing new so far. The East Asian <coughs> development model in the 1980s, the very similar, very similar, <laughs> because I engaged in a project of uh, East Asian Development Model, uh, many, many projects in the 1980s. State-led uh, uh, industrial policies, export-oriented policies, and uh, our Asian style is uh, different from uh, Western styles. Uh, you have to be more cautious about uh, human touch or human kind of not uh, and, um, things or you know, the money or so. And also we focused on the, uh, what's uh, our essence of uh, the values. And uh, people, oh, probably Confucius, Confucianism. And then uh, the Japanese government poured a huge amount of money for studying about uh, what's the essence of uh, the Asian culture, something like that. And uh, all, all failed, all failed. Not, not failed, actually. Uh, and also, uh, why Japanese corporations so successful? That was a family-based. The corporations are family and uh, not the contract based. It's a different, the, the all kind of a discussion we did yeah, in, the, in, the, in the 1980s. And then there was something new, but uh, uh, also Asian type of uh, democracy or human rights. Uh, and so we could not develop further, uh, particularly after, uh, after the Asian monetary crisis that the 1997. So all stopped and then. So, so far I say, yes, uh, China has been challenging, it's true, but at the same time, what's new? So that is another challenge to me. And uh, I think a critical issue for China present day is I think uh, lack of uh, the future vision, lack of future vision. And people say, or government also say that the democracy is going to be the final goal, something like that. They. Uh, admit, but there is no 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 process, no explaining the uh, process for how you get the democracy. That the need that is very necessary for the ordinary people now. People just waiting for the visions. 
You don't know when it's going to be the democracy. That's the lack of vision. You, you cannot talk about China, of course. Our Japan is lacking the total vision. <laughs> the same, probably U.S. might have some uh, you know, difficulties too. But anyway, China needs a certain yeah, future vision. That is a key issue. Wang Hui. Okay. <coughs> yes, I agree with that, that the, uh, the vision is so important. That, uh, that's why we thought that uh, when we talk about the, the, uh, the political issues, that the, the, the political vision was uh, very, very important. I just uh, spontaneously respond to, 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 to that. I, and I go back to the earlier question about the purchase and the, the buying offices and the, the corruption. Uh, it's obviously there was a very serious in different locations. Of course, the level was different. It really depends on different regions, that uh, the cities and so on and so forth. And also that I think that question related to the uh, Professor Phil Smith who raised the issue. That's why we talk about the party, the role, and the state. Because now we know that the, the uh, anti-corruption mechanism mainly depends on the party discipline committee, commission to do that. And without that, it became very difficult. That's why I say that the, 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 the role of the party, in that sense, integrated into the state framework. The functionally, it's a, it's a play that role of that uh, that part. So this is the phenomena. I think that the the uh, uh, that's why on the one hand, the people talk about the se separation between the party and the state, but on the other hand, no resistance for the party's integration into the state in these regards. So that's why they did no not so much. It's a the, the, because we found that the. the uh, Without that, the, the system, it, the corruption could, could be much more serious. But then the question is that the ones that the, if the party system itself integrated into the state so deeply, how could the, what kind of mechanism can guarantee that the party itself can immune from that the corruption system, the corruption, the network, and so on and so forth? That's the uh, the, the issue, and and and. and the, the whole issue is that, that, that the, uh, my, uh, in, my, in my term is that the now it's in the era of the so-called depoliticization. Because the political process seemed that uh, stopped everywhere. It's the, uh, the, you mentioned that the party state. But my term is that the from party state to state party is, is the, uh, quite a universal phenomenon that uh, even in the multi-party system, the party itself was quite different from older pattern. It's uh, much more neutralized to address the, the general votes, for example, in the West sense. So in this case, the, the issue, the vision is that the, in this kind of the globalization and uh, marketization, what kind of the political vision to think about the, uh, the democracy itself? That because now we, if we want to have a more uh, substantial democracy in our society, we really need to think about the basic uh, precondition. Now the uh, historical situation ch transformed so much. Without that thinking, reflection on this, it's difficult to uh, co copy any model to, to do that. But in any case, I think now the Chi in, in Chinese cases, I think the most important thing is that how may the, uh, lo the lower strata demand can be heard, their demands can be heard in the, the, polic uh, policy, maker, the pol uh, policy making process. The problem is that the now, especially in, in, when I involved in some in investigation of the cases, I feel the most difficult process is that the, the uh, Without the uh, strong protest, that the demands were difficult to be heard. So that could be the, uh, uh, it's uh, quite, uh, I think it's a re real crisis. We need to think about that, uh, what kind of the way to make that the society and the more channels to be heard in a political sphere. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder if I can just take off quickly on, on one of the last things Wang Hui said. So the integration of, of party and government is, is not only a feature of the yeah. disciplinary system, it's a feature of everything. everything. Yeah. So that the entire organizational structure is incredibly uh, well, well, maybe well-tuned is not the right word. It, it's 
tuned to an incredibly high pitch to achieve a relatively limited number of objectives, economic growth, controlling corruption, one or two others. And so that's what worries me, you know, because, I mean, Panway says, well, we shouldn't expect a collapse, and I, I certainly agree. But at the same time, we see this system which has now generated this incredible momentum in a certain direction. And we face this very peculiar situation right now where for five years, the top leaders have said they're going to reduce the investment rate and create a more balanced growth path. And it hasn't happened. So here's a system that's supposed to be authoritarian and under control, and it's going off in a direction that seems to be very different from what the, the top leaders claim. And maybe that's an expression of the fact that the system is so tightly wound, so integrated, and so devoted to a certain specific objectives, which might not be appropriate. Go ahead, Mr. May I respond to that, Barry? Um, the interesting thing about China in terms of macroeconomic management was that until 2007, we talked about that already, they were close to being in control, to getting control over overheating and to, to deflating the bubble in real estate in 2007. And then this huge downturn came and exports fell off the cliff, as you said. Yeah, it's really, uh, the problem was that they gave a huge bit, all their mobilization of power they had again. They mobilized all the resources, the huge resources they have at their disposal, and they pushed things forward again. And they overpushed it, probably, most probably, but um, it was kind of a panicky reaction. And that says something. The first thing that it says, macroeconomic stabilization was close to being achieved in 2007. So that was actually the kind of stabilization that the planners were dreaming of. Really, all the big balances were kind of in harmony at that time. They were very, very careful in doing that. And they were talking, praising this, and then this, 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 this uh, damned crisis came at the wrong time. And they had to push forward things in the planned economy style again, command economy way. And they were actually capable of doing that, but they are paying a high price now probably in the next few years. So I would say the stabilization goal was there and was close to being achieved with kind of new methods, very nuanced kinds of methods, command economy methods, market monetary methods, and, and so forth. They were kind of uh, recombining the instruments that they had at their disposal, which are very different from Western market systems. And then this crisis came and pushed them into a more command economy style handling of the crisis again. That would, would be the story how I would give it. I don't know whether it's, it's plausible. And of course, the Chinese yeah. economy isn't the only one uh, right, to, have exactly. <laughs> to respond in right, ways right. not of its own choosing in recent right. years. Right. Um, Gwendolyn? Yes, I have a question for you. My planetary note is I keep hearing exceptionalism and remembering when there was American exceptionalism and now I'm hearing Chinese exceptionalism, Chinese exceptionalism. <laughs> you pose the question of explaining the rise of China, a challenge to Western social science theories. And we responded to the one gentleman who asked what his field was. And, and I wonder. If you're not, well, do you feel that, that you've heard enough to, to say overthrow the, the Western model of social science or something, and, and are you going to announce this in the government department? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, <here. laughs> so I, uh, I always have this question about um, the model of social science, and I'm going to raise this question to Mr. Um, you've talked about the problem of uh, predefined uh, sort of teleological Um, I think um, it's very, you sort of point out one problem with this uh, approach, which is like the model might not be correct, it might not be accurate. But I, I think a hidden problem is that the model um, also has a material impact on the society. Um, I think you very quickly touch upon an example of how um, sort of government or uh, foundations <coughs> in the US um, try to uh, fund, like, Organizations like the China village election thing, maybe for right? mm -hmm. like civil society in China. Mm -hmm. So even though this model of civil society or um, I think NGOs mm -hmm. might in the first place be misleading, um, they are actually creating this um, infrastructure there. And now Chinese people are actually talking about um, NGOs and civil society. Mm -hmm. um, I think a larger question is here um, we have scholars talking about um, China as outsiders. But I think at the same time, people are actually um, in a process of interacting mm -hmm. with Chinese people. Um, I think Professor, for example, Professor Tony Seich in the um, uh, Canadian School of Government is teaching Chinese officials. So I think 
there is not a clear line between scholars and what's actually happening in China, and the scholars might not be um, just observers, and there's, prob there's the problem of interacting okay. between what's described and who is described. Mm -hmm. Another question, yes, in the back there. Well, market democracy isn't necessarily social economic democracy. Um, the Western models of so-called democracy contain vast disparities and inequalities in the uh, class. Uh, which have almost been made permanent. Uh, in entertaining these visions uh, that you're suggesting, uh, can the discussion also be broadened to include some form of uh, deeper economic democracy as well as just representational political democracy? This seems to be the real question in Indians. I mean, you can always reproduce the Western model. That's not a big problem. But can you do something better, please? <laughs> okay, I think Wang Hui started down that road in his first comments talking about redistribution, but yes. Democracy inside of the party, uh, dynamic itself. I think, how do you like, tell the difference between the dynamic and the uh, like mass people's democracy? And how do you think about is the uh, the process? How do you, could you please, please specify on the process of, and the style of the uh, dynamic? And does this kind of um, democracy inside of the party really can serve the interest of the mass people? So could you give me some specific cases on this issue? Any further questions, Peter? I think uh, Wang Wei did an excellent job of explaining some of the factors that have contributed to the success in the pre-78 period, 1949. But I think one way to characterize the success would be that it's been based on two, I guess they're not social science principles, but seem to me to be objectively um, arguable. One is that no matter how common the problem is, the way it's perceived, priority accorded to it, and the way it's responded to depends on where you are and when you're there. And secondly, most of the problems we're talking about, inherently social, if you will, are characterized by a high degree of complexity, dynamism, and local specificity. Now, the success of the system so far seems to me to have been the manifestation of a, the implementation of those basic realities. We're working within that framework. And I would even argue that the change from 70 to 90 or 07 is a practice, is a pragmatic response to a changing set of circumstances, which have led both China putting, investing more when it's supposed to be spending more, and the US spending more when it's supposed to be saving more. Both sides, both sides have recognized that in principle that's what they ought to be doing. But the immediate reality to which they're responding requires just the opposite response. Yeah. And I would see that as an asset, not as a liability. And the question for me, for the panel, would be, what factors are likely to uh, move China away from that responsive, that responsive model and introduce rigidities, a model, if you will, uh, of, that would be more rigid and less, less able to respond to the location, specificity, complexity, dynamism, uh, of the problems which will inevitably confront China as they will a real society in different forms this time. Okay, uh, turn back to the panel here. We have this room only for another 15 minutes or so, so um, we uh, need to wrap things up. But let me give uh, all the panelists an opportunity to respond to what's been raised. Who would like to start out me? here? Pan Wei? Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, well, um, it seems that China exceptional, or, or China exceptionalism um, is, uh, has always been the, uh, the situation, huh? but, social science theory but, but social science theory wants the universal. But I think, uh, but once we reduce what we learned as universal as a local uh, knowledge, then uh, China is a local knowledge. And then, you know, it's both can be inspiring. If we talk about all about universalism and some patterns and the regulations, and then uh, it seems humans are like a, like puppets of the law. So uh, it's boring for me. Uh, and uh, so that uh, I would like to 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 see the pre uh, uh, supposed uh, universal laws as somehow. 
uh, understood as local. And uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, this one point. Another is that uh, I would like to talk about the uh, the uh, the Minju or uh, inside party democracy. Actually, lots of people do believe in uh, the Westernizing Chinese system, and they couldn't. They failed in the grassroots way. For, uh, ex they had expected that the, the, the democracy electoral politics would go from bottom up, but then it, the experiment failed, and then they want to imitate that, like the Soviet model, and to to split the party from the within, and uh, that's the uh, original idea. But now it seems that it's changed, diverted to another one by the party itself, saying that about transparency. And whether this electoral politics could control corruption, I think it is quite clear from worldwide experience and from inside China that electoral politics increases corruption. It does not control or curb corruption. And another one is about investment uh, in the in heavy investment and less consumption. It is something from the command economy, and it's something also from the high savings from the Chinese tradition, and more investment for the future. And for me, as I'm going to, to be old and uh, going to retire, I really want the government to invest in infrastructure. That means the future, because we have a future, fewer younger people. And those younger people would make a lot more money with the advanced infrastructure. So that is a guarantee for our pension. And uh, so forth, as an old people, I really want the, the state to invest more and uh, consume less right now. OK? <laughs> Wang Hui, would you like to respond? <coughs> oh, OK. <coughs> who, who would uh, other panelists? Sebastian? Something better, please, was the, was the question here in terms of, of models. I think really, I mean, this is something that I find challenging about China. I think that our um, established mature systems, that's how advanced political economies, have really um, moved into a situation where there's much higher uncertainty than most people actually accept. And so there might be something about this 21st century in terms of complexity, in terms of, uh, of volatility also, that's very different from what we have seen before. So I think, I really think, and I, this was kind of the, 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 the under uh, tone the, 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 uh, of, my, of my presentation here, I really think that we have to move forward in terms of modernizing governance and what, what kind of policy making modes, long term policy making. We cannot afford this kind of short termism anymore that we've seen, that we've become used to in the last century. And um, so there's really something new here. And, and China kind of poses some challenges, some questions. They don't find solutions that we can just replicate in our systems. But I think there's really something big going on. The credibility crisis that we have seen in the, in the markets is only the beginning. I mean, this is only a small step, actually, now to become a credibility crisis for, for democratic governance also, for many democratic govern governments. And we have some parts of that in Europe already. There are some, some indicators of that already in, in individual countries. And um, this is very serious. So I really think think this is a big project, actually, to, to look at China with curious eyes and to, to find out how they solve these problems, especially in a developing or emerging country context. And there's a lot to learn in terms of how you keep it open, how you don't keep make it rigid. And this is now the, the question, the last sort of thing that I want to say is um, I think there is a vision, actually, in China. It's not probably pronounced and, and announced in a, in a public way, but it's really becoming number one, overtaking the US. And this will be the point in time, maybe. This is just a speculation when rigidity start, because then they are the superior system, and they are at the top. This kind of catching up process is always easy. But as IR th uh, observation theories show, the conflicts will probably aggravate as clo the closer China comes to, to overtaking the US. Within the next uh, few decades, if this happens, the more conflicts will come up. This is something that's, that's <laughs> kind of, so it's actually, again, this dynamics where the policy models and, 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 uh, and rigidities actually interact with this kind of, of, of dialectics in, in world politics also. So it's, it's, for me, studying China's governance is really a, a much more general challenge that also applies to Western governance. I don't think we can, we can move forward with this kind of short-termism that we have become used to uh, in the last century. 
Professor Kokubo? Yes. Uh, what China is uh, facing right now is the, not the problem of, of uh, social sciences, but uh, the reality. Now, uh, I, I, today I mostly talked about kind of a, the analogical uh, context between Japanese case and Chinese case. But at uh, one point, uh, it's uh, very different because uh, Japan uh, experienced a lot and uh, failed many things. But Japan, the, the failure did not have a great impact on the world economy at all. Japan experienced by ourselves and failed by ourselves. But now China is the center of the world economy. And we, the world, of course, the uh, United States, Japan, are heavily depending on the China's uh, economic situation. So this is a bit different. And so I think uh, China's uh, present situation is very crucial. This is my, my observation. And uh, people talking about uh, what's the privilege of uh, the, the Chinese uh, politics or, or economy. Uh, so far, I say no cleavages uh, within the party, top leaders. Probably Xi Jinping is going to be the next leader, probably. And the military, probably no cleavages. Vested interest everywhere. And uh, probably uh, no such like uh, uh, Tiananmen, no probably uh, student demonstration. What is the crucial point? And uh, the China's stability, of course, is heavily dependent on the economic growth, economic uh, developments. We just concern about the economic crash these days. Bubble. That is the key. Now, uh, it seems to me that's, I, I, today I talked about the Japanese experience. That was the beginning 20 years ago. We could not recover in the 10 years, and then uh, another 20, another 10 years, altogether 20 years. I think uh, we concerned, uh, we really concerned about China's uh, economic uh, situation. That could be another the, uh, part of, you know, point of the privilege in the future. And Chinese economy is, is the bubble exactly happening. So it's going to be very dangerous. So, so probably Barry will talk about <laughs> this is going to be the final. <laughs> I guess I can't uh, can't not take that up. Um, I, I mean, to me, the 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 different parts of this conversation raise the question of whether Chinese developmental policy will adapt within the next year, three years, five years, to meet the needs of an increasingly sophisticated and prosperous economy. And I'm not so worried about the contemporary bubble. I mean, I do. Wor I worry about it for sure. But, <laughs> but, um, but the bigger question to me is whether the policy can start to move again in the direction of institutional reforms that will change the underpinnings for this sort of narrowly focused growth. In other words, can we have institutional reforms that change the land system? Can we have? Um, financial reforms that allow the financial system to be more diverse and more resilient. Um, let's let the currency appreciate a little, not because the Americans want it, but because it's good for the Chinese economy. Um, in other words, there's a whole series of, of, of reforms. It's not like any is essential and have to be done in the next six months, but we need to see a renewal of movement in that direction, and I'm worried that we, we're not really seeing it. So that's sort of my worries more than, more than just the bubble. Okay. Um, and I try to make some response to the uh, uh, democracy within the party system, that, that the people talk about these issues. I think that uh, maybe I'm not to give the answer to a whole, whole issue. I do believe that we need to, even historically speaking, we can find some mechanism from within. For example, the political debates, the theoretical debates within the party was not a new thing. 
the, the, uh, the, the old thing is that uh, there were debates, long debates, series of debates, but without the democrati uh, democracy system to guarantee that every part participants involved in these debates can, after the, uh, they lose the, the, the debates, they still can sustainable within the party. That's the old uh, the, the problem. But now I think that the certain kind of the, the open discussion and the debates and uh, it's not only the uh, election system, but also the open opening up of the uh, policy debates and the political debates within that. It's it's I think it's uh, important that what kind of the system can guarantee that the, the certain kind of the uh, the, the uh, democratic the system can guarantee that the, the mechanism keep going on. That I think is uh, one. Second, it's not possible to have a. Uh, the, the pure uh, democ democratic system within one party system, because you already, the party was, was uh, how to embedded in the whole social network. So obviously the whole public debate was, uh, is a societal issue, not, uh, not simply within the party. I think it's uh, last year that there were several uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the cases, we can see that uh, I mentioned some of that, like uh, Sanong debates, health care debates, and some other debates, not started from the party. It started from the like, intellectual debates in the mass media, but they can translate it into the policy debate within the system. That uh, was not stable, but still you can find that the interaction between these two systems. I, so in that way, we, we, try to, we can try to find a different kind of the elements to develop more stable framework for that ki kind of the transparency. I think that, that is uh, 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 important. Second is that the, the, uh, we find that the, the, the uh, uh, for example, we talk about the Jap Japanese uh, the, the cases. It's, uh, on the one hand, there's a lot of the similarities. People talk about the East Asia model and so on, whether or not that's the model. But if you look at the experience, it's still quite a different. Because look back to the uh, Cold War period. Generally speaking, the uh, uh, Japan, Korea, and uh, Taiwan was much more, it's uh, in the Cold War structure that, that quite uh, dependent on the American lead the system. Without that the, the uh, framework, it's difficult to explain these uh, developments. So in that way, different from Latin America, certain kind of the dependent developments could, could explain that. And also you see that the, the, uh, the, uh, the consequence of that the rise and the fall, why it's not, because of within that system. But Chinese, the experience, I think, is to some extent, it was in that way, there was some certain kind of uniqueness because in the Cold War structure, it's m much more self-reliance. It's, it's economy, it's self much more, but only after the uh, uh, decades of reform that the, the uh, integrated in, into the whole world system. So now the, uh, the consequence of what's the fall and the down, uh, it's became in this way. At the same time, I uh, talk about the bubble. It, 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 there was a lot of the bubbles. The real estate issue was obviously this, uh, there was, a, and also there's a big threat to the financial system too. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the uh, sometimes I feel, when I observe my own country, I feel quite uh, contradictory. On the one hand, you find a lot of problems, the bubbles, and uh, worried about so deeply. But on the other hand, you find that the. Uh, some, sometimes the policy change was so quick. So then they can do that. That's why that last time we, uh, the, the Neil Ferguson, after his visit to Chongqing, they immediately realized that uh, how fast that the change from the exportation-oriented economy to the, uh, the domestic driving economy in the inland, uh, uh, the, uh, the inland China. So that, that's the why he saw that the, in the, such a short period, even last year, the, the people say, it's no way because, it's, but suddenly some kind of the change. So in this case, I think that the, some kind of the renovation, institutional renovation is happening. And that at the same time was, at same, as, as well as at simultaneously with the uh, bubbles continued. So this is a contradictory map for me. Is uh, sometimes I have some hope. Sometimes I I feel quite uh, desperate. This is the, the I could only explain that the, the feeling of that. Yeah. 
Well, I would like to thank the panelists uh, for an extremely stimulating several uh, hours. I'll make a few closing comments myself since Gwendolyn provoked me. Um, and, um, and then we'll have a reception uh, up above to which you are all welcome uh, to engage the panelists further. Um, my own purpose in calling this session together is not to uh, develop some new model uh, to unveil to the social sciences, but it is to try to explain what has happened in China in the past 30 years. And I think uh, what we have available as Western social scientists doesn't give us very good leverage on it. Um, uh, perhaps economists were less surprised than I suggested at the outset by the economic growth, but I, I don't think they really were. This is the fastest economic transition <laughs> the world has ever seen, and it's uh, occurring in the biggest country in the world. This is extraordinary. Um, sure, they knew there was tremendous unleashed market, uh, uh, there was tremendous market potential to be unleashed, um, but to maintain this level of economic growth for a 30 year year period is extraordinary. And to do it within a political system that is basically unreformed is, I think, a real challenge to the social sciences. Now, unlike Poway, I'm not going to predict uh, how long this will last. If Poway is right and it lasts for 20 years, then I won't have to announce this to my colleagues in the government department. I think they'll all be studying it by that point. Um, um, because it will be seen uh, as uh, a huge challenge, I think, uh, to the models that we have. So how do we explain this? And um, I don't pretend to have the right answer, but like Pan Wei, I've been searching in China's past, uh, looking at certain precedents out of the imperial period, out of the revolutionary period, out of the Maoist period, all of which I think are important, but none of which guaranteed this outcome. And that's why I wouldn't use the term China model, which to me has a little bit too much of a kind of uh, systematic, internally coherent, um, cohesive, predictable quality to it. Uh, to me, this is quite an unpredictable and quite um, an unexpected uh, occurrence that is full of contingency, full of accident, full of human personalities, um, and yet does uh, require some grounding in China's own past history to understand. Um, and it's in that uh, spirit that um, I call together um, this panel. I think it's been uh, a really very stimulating panel with very different uh, viewpoints. And again, I would really like to thank uh, all five of the panelists uh, for their very insightful comments. Thank you. Thank you.